welcome to the finale for our Delta Green series, everyone. We hope you've been having a properly spooky month so far, and we're really glad you are spending a bit of that time here with us. But before we get to the discussion episode for this series, and of course, our fanfic, favorite part, here's what is coming up in the call to action after the show. Yeah. Uh, we are going to have a final announcement about the Kickstarter for the Rebels of the Outlaw Wastes. Uh, a few notes on our recent migration over to the Megaphone platform and what it means uh, for the format of the show going forward. Uh, a reminder of a new campaign beginning in the One Shot Network Secret Archive, uh, as well as the normal patron thank yous and standard podcast send-offs uh, as we don't have any new reviews to dive into this week. That's what I want for Christmas, dear listeners. Reviews. Definitely like some... Oh, actually, my birthday is next month, so... Um, for my birthday... Right now, if you were thinking, <laughs> gosh, what could I get Amelia? <laughs> a review uh, would be fantastic. A, a review would be great. Stay tuned for all of that as well as our series outtakes... Um, at, after the credits. Until then, enjoy the show, everyone. Welcome back to our discussion episode. Last time, we finished our session zero for Delta Green. This episode, we will be discussing the character creation process. We are excited to welcome back Justin Jess. Do you want to reintroduce yourself for everyone at home and tell us a little bit about the character you made in the last episode? Hi, my name is Justin Jess. I am a pop culture writer and podcaster. Um, if you want to listen to all my Plugs, listen to the last couple episodes because frankly, it takes too long. Um, <laughs> well, also, we'll make you say them again at the end. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah just wait, wait till the end. Trust me, they're mm -hmm. not that interesting. Um, so, last no, you have to, they're super interesting. And now you have to listen to the entire episode or you won't <laughs> get to find out. Uh -huh. um, so, last episode, I made Mary Adler um, a physician with Doctors Without Borders who is obsessed with protecting people. And uh, and the truth. Ryan, can you tell us about your character? Uh, absolutely. I made April O. Jacobs. Uh, April Jacobs uh, is a TV uh, news anchor for WNWZ, um, the the local uh, TV station uh, somewhere in wherever North America. Uh, I don't remember. Is that like the the east of the Mississippi or something like that. You yes. looked it up and it is a station in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It is. Yeah. It's technically the, the, the a station dividing line, Yeah, the di dividing line for W and K is the Mississippi. Mississippi. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're west of the Mississippi. Uh, in uh, Nope, we're east of the Mississippi. Oh, no. All right. I, I lost I lost everything. Is it a KNWZ? I don't know. Doesn't no, matter. you said W and W Z. <laughs> Regardless, I'm the one with memory loss here. Why? <laughs> it's fine. So April is a uh, a news anchor. Uh, she is uh, four foot eleven uh, and wears a lot of yellow. Um, <laughs> just just be. I hate you. I hate you. <laughs> That that was that, and I hate that I get that reference. I know that that reference was that literally just for Amelia. Um, mm -hmm. It's fine, um, but she is uh, somebody that wants to uncover the truth, and uh, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to get the scoop of a lifetime uh, by by joining Delta Green uh, in in their shenanigans. Not gonna uh, go well. No, <laughs> it'll, be sure, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> Uh, Amelia, can you tell us about your character? Absolutely. My character <laughs> is Illuminata M. Justice. Uh, 
She works at the Library of Congress in the Defense Research Division. She is a historian, translator, and researcher, and conspiracy theory enthusiast. <laughs> Uh, she's also incredibly clumsy and always has a little bit of food on her shirt because she just can't get it in her mouth. It's just how it works sometimes. Amazing. Well, let's go ahead and dive right into a segment we are calling D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts. So in this segment, we want to talk up to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process and how it relates to this system and others. But first, the most cliche question in RPG podcasting. Justin, please tell us how you got into RPGs and what brought you here. So I got, so like my first experience to like what we would consider like traditional RPGs, um, like outside of like Pokemon was Mm -hmm. um, the Knights of the Old Republic video game Mm. for when I was playing it on the original Xbox because it's based off of D20. And, um, and like, I, I remember, like, you could look at the combat logs in it, and I found that very fascinating. And then when I was on a winter camp trip with my church, like, somebody ran, like, a, a an encounter in D&D 3.0. Mm. And then it was, like, this was in my head, but I didn't really even, like, tr- like, I didn't really find a group or anything for years um and Mm -hmm. then i found out that i was like i liked storytelling and creating worlds and storytelling so um my initial i think the first thing i ever ran was rogue trader um which is which is the one of the warhammer 40,000 rpgs Mm -hmm. that fantasy flight released that are we'll call them interesting they're not Mm. good they're interesting um (laughs) um but yeah over the years i started branching out looking into more stuff and i am where i am now which is a miserable pile of rpg knowledge (laughs) welcome Mm -hmm. yep yep yeah none of it is like useful for you know i mean part of it is being a great member of society i guess yeah i know but like i can i can tell you weird things about like you know Dracula lore, but, you know. Right. My favorite is people will like say something, and then now after having done the Ennies for two years, I'm like, oh, I know a game for that. Do you want to, like, <laughs> oh, like I know a game about being like a traveling member in a punk band. If you want, I can give that to you know. Mm-hmm. Like, and people are like, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, people. Don't say I didn't offer. <laughs> Uh, well, Justin, what do you look for in a system as far as character creation goes? Like, what sort of pieces need to be there for uh, great characters to happen, in your opinion? Um, so, as somebody who, like, like, the thing that I primarily look for in character creation is because I am somebody who's always going to be able to find a character in anything. Like, you know, I, I'm I'm somebody who's, you know, if I like to fill in blanks, and mm-hmm. figure out if there isn't a character already present, I'll fill in the blanks for that. One of the things that really matters to me is to be able to figure out what a character does. Like, what are what are they going to be able to do in the narrative? And what are they functionally going to be able to do? Um, I come from, like, you know, the first, I'd say, like, generation of games that I played didn't have very competent characters. Mm-hmm. And I am from a near, I, like, I'd say, like, I come from, like, a narrative school that it, that I enjoy the leverage hyper-competency porn, um, mm-hmm. as John Fair. Rogers describes it, where it's, like, I like cool people doing cool stuff well. Um, mm-hmm. So I like yeah. to be able to, like, see what a character does uh, and and what how they're able to affect the narrative. That's, that's always the thing for me. It's why I like PBTA games, um, mm-hmm. because you're always going to have, like, this is going to be telling you this is what you should be focusing on in your narrative. This should be what you're doing at and focusing yeah, on. Yeah, it's very clear, like what your role is. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. And I'd say like Delta Green does that in a sense of like it tells you exactly what your job is. Mm-hmm. Um, and like sure, you've got like hobbies that round out your character and stuff, but you 
especially in a game where you're like, okay, you're going on missions. Um, right. You know, it's like, okay, this is what I'm good at and what I'm going to be able to provide to the team. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We started to touch on this a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, but let's like, let's really talk about it. We like to look at the character sheets and talk about why they were designed that way and what it can tell us about the game just from looking at it before we really, you know, the character sheet is like sort of the first interaction you have with a game a lot mm-hmm. of times. Um, so what do you think these character sheets tell us about this game? I think one of the, the best things that it does is it puts you, it shifts you into the genre purposefully. Um, mm-hmm. every, like the Delta Green character sheet, it looks like a form you'd get at the DMV almost. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's, it's a lot of blocky lines. There are big space, you know, there are spaces to write stuff. There's maybe a one or two fields where you don't have enough space to write anything of worth, but you'd want to put something of worth there. So it's perfect. It's a government form. Um, it's perfect. Like, I love that it, like, asks, like, name, date of birth. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, exactly like I would put, yeah, on my driver's license application. Yeah, and mm-hmm. there's, like, useless, um, there's, like, useless numbers and, um, and like, they, they have, like, a... A, what security clearance you need to view the character sheet on there it's just random <laughs> stuff like that and in the very smallest watermark it, 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 it's printed on the character sheet this is a work of fiction oh. mm-hmm. <laughs> i see that yeah it's tiny but it's like there it's um and like it and there are, and i mean on the back too it says you like dd united states form 315 there's like a serial number at the bottom like it's they went for it. Mm-hmm. There's even a crease where it's folded, where it's been folded. Really? Um, on the first page, underneath the physical description, there is an mm. there is a slightly tilted line for like where this is where it's been folded to be shoved in a file, and you can see it on the back sheet yeah. as well. And it's, it's it's these things that like I think one of the things that Delta Green does exceptionally well. Um, in its art, it is its art execution and how much it makes the world feel lived in. Um, yes, and the character sheet is pro- possibly the perfect example of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. Yeah, I noticed. Um, I mean, that was the thing that I saw, like when I looked at Impossible Landscapes too, um, which we haven't really talked about here. It's a supplement for the game that it's just like the way it's laid out and like the way and even the the core book for this too the way that like all of the photographs are like taped to the pages and like you know it just feels very like somebody handed you a file mm-hmm. it takes that like uh call of cthulhu has like a long tradition of handouts of mm-hmm. like yes. you know giving giving very like Stuff that looks old because the, the, the base setting of Call of Cthulhu is the 1920s. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, giving people like either a picture of something, a letter, something to evoke, like something as a clue that's there to both evoke like, oh, hey, this is where we need to go next to the pl- plot and or here's some spooky mystery, but also placing it directly as either something old or something in a period. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And everything, yeah, as as you're saying, everything feels like it's part of a file and like everything's taped in. Um everything is the photogra like the, the art style is photorealistic to a point, except mm-hmm. when there's anything supernatural going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that the art style in the book is like it's it's got the photo realism but like a uh, slightly painted feel to it mm-hmm. yeah right mm-hmm. which is kind of cool yeah it's yeah uh yeah it's always like one of the things that Delza green always does perf like aces is the art execution for it mm-hmm. uh, it's got a style and it executes that to the max absolutely yeah i i really love this character sheet mm-hmm. like it's so good yeah, and it, it seems to flow well too for when we would use uh like weapons and stuff. You go to that second page, and then when you're like looking at your stats and skills, you go to the first page and 
uh, it's it's an interesting flow, and it it felt easy enough to follow along, like what I had to do next for character creation, right? Mm-hmm. I know one thing that I always look at too at the sheets is like as I'm doing character creation, was there any moment where I wasn't sure where to put something where the book was like, here's the next step. And I was like, where do I write that down? Yeah. Uh, so I guess in that way, it doesn't feel like a government form, <laughs> but in a practical RPG way, <laughs> it was great. Yeah. <laughs> As a player, to, I loved it. It wants you to evoke the feeling, but not the experience of filling out a government form. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. That's where the real horror is actually yeah. is that you have right. to. <laughs> it's it's funny too because like every section has a number before it. So 14 wounds and ailments. 16 A through G is your weapons. So instead of just yeah. like section 16, here's your weapon list. It's Please 16 refer A, to section 16, 16A. Yeah. I'm gonna be yeah. using 16 C for this, I believe. Uh yeah. that's your shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so great. Yeah, so no, great. it's pretty cool. I like it. Uh, so how do we think character creation in Delta Green stacks up to other systems that we've played, uh, especially like any other cosmic horror games out there? You all have done base Call of Cthulhu, right? Just out, We to... have. Yeah. Okay. We did last October. Yeah. Yep. Which um, there's a lot more math to do in base Call of Cthulhu. Yeah. Um, and it's all based on like, two stats um Mm -hmm. which is i'm gonna say not my favorite um (laughs) i it's like oh the the only things that matter are your education and intelligence really um don't love it it's Mm -hmm. like they're they're coming from the same tree but like call of cthulhu has like even its most recent editions where it is like there is an honest intent to try to make the game more accessible it is still it's still Call of Cthulhu. Yeah, it's still Call of Cthulhu. It is still 30 years old and still has all of these legacy components that are mm-hmm. still there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I really liked that this felt like they made it simple for me. There are a lot of numbers, you mm-hmm. know, in dealing with all of these percentages and stuff. But instead of being like, here's all the skills, choose 10. They were like, why don't you pick a category and then we'll tell you what those are. Mm -hmm. Like, which for my sort of analysis paralysis brain, that was great. It was like, we'll break it down for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do like the archetypes uh, that they had here for your different characters you could choose from. I mean, it seemed to have a wide array of character types that you could Mm -hmm. choose, Mm -hmm. which was great. Um, and even like super special, like media specialist, I guess, is you wouldn't think of that as like a character type to just create from scratch. But like, you know, now it's there. And there, I saw firefighter was in there yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think that like this is another thing that you would talk to your GM about, obviously. But like if you were in a position where you had a specific idea for a character and mm-hmm. like the book is like, here's your skills. And you were like, hmm. Can I pick something up? Like, there, you know, yeah. as always, you can have those conversations mm-hmm. because I do know that like getting a skill package sometimes feels restrictive mm-hmm. yeah. um, when you have an idea in mind. But uh, I like not having to pick out skills or like look up what everything is and be like, is this mm-hmm. the thing that matches the the profession I want to do? They're like, here you go. <laughs> yeah, there is. I I think like. The the bonus packages help with that, like letting you shape the character a little bit more. And, mm-hmm, a lo- definitely. and at least a lot of the professional packages give you options of like, here's the stuff that you're going to be like that you're going to need if you're this job. But there's at least like some flexibility within there. Right. Definitely. Um, what do you think as far as cosmic horror, um, um, how this handles that kind of genre and you know, that kind of feeling? Um I think what it does is it, I don't think it's like the, the horror isn't in making your character. It is mm-hmm. in for it's in using it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. I, unless you are d- deciding to do it with one of the veteran options, um, then there isn't like that cosmic horror isn't really making its appearance in it. But when you are trying to figure out what your motivations are and why you're doing this, I think that's an important yeah. thing to examine mm-hmm. over, like, your character has not received 
any, you know, they're they're doing this volunteer work. Mm-hmm. And they've decided to become a mem- you know, they've decided to become a member of Delta Green. Why are they doing this? I think is a good it's a good opener mm-hmm. to the genre. Yeah. Of like why like why are you choosing to confront these horrors? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm trying to think when we did Call of Cthulhu, like there wasn't a lot of question of like why why do you care about horror stuff? Mm-hmm. Like what you know, it was like I I was sure to like pick skills that would be helpful, but I don't really remember having a lot of discussion about the horror. Yeah, because it, it feels like in a Call of Cthulhu, it's you are these normal people. You've got normal like life stuff that you mm-hmm. have as a character. You build that all into character creation. And the game itself is horror happens at you. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, didn't I like run a speakeasy? Wasn't that? Yeah. And you were like pretending to be your twin. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. And, Mm -hmm. and it was like, uh, sure. Some of it was like a little extra dramatic and stuff, right? but like it had nothing to do with cosmic horror. And it felt like in Call of Cthulhu, it's like, you're just uh, going about your business and then boom, cosmic horror happens at you. Whereas it feels like this game, you're signing up for cosmic horror. Yeah, in Call of Cthulhu, you are victims. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Like you are victims who are not a, who who are going to be exposed to this thing. In Delta Green, you are, I mean, you're the first response team, yeah. um, which creates a different feel. But it, but it asks those questions because they're. I I mentioned this earlier, but like Delta Green came from the idea of why do you go into the haunted house? Um, yeah, and like, mm-hmm. and wanted to give a framework to, especially in the modern day, why would you do that? Like, why would characters do that? And I think like a lot of the the personality questions and the stuff you're looking at with motivation and some of the questions that are asked in like the character creation steps in the latter parts are asking about like, why are you doing this? Uh, like, what keeps you going? And yeah, I think that I think that is a it's a very good thing to solidify the genre in that regard to remind mm-hmm. you that like you're not a victim. You are act, you are acting against the unnatural. I think it also um, gives you a lot more connection to playing that character yeah. because, you know, like I can feel connections to the characters that I've made and then like throw them into a game and be like this has nothing to do with what i made um but this one sort of forces you to buy into the concept of the game from go because you have to say all right why am i doing this Mm -hmm. why why am i here at all (laughs) yeah it it assumes that you want to be part of this um instead of like okay make this character and now you know do they want to be a part of this? The answer can be no. And here it's the answer was yes. You're you're right. a part of this. No. I, I think and like I get frustrated about that in a lot of games yeah. because yeah, I always say, I'm like, if I am sitting in a tavern and some dude with a sword comes in is like, come on. Like maybe it's being a woman, but I am not leaving with a man with a sword from a bar. Yeah. Right. Like it's never gonna happen. The answer is no. So like that's already a big assumption. <laughs> I think there is a there is a there is a a two sided agreement that needs to be made of like that the game framework needs to give you a good reason to go on this, and mm-hmm. that you need to have a character who is willing to engage with it. Um, right there, there is a there is a uh, like there's a joke in the like in, in Delta Green fan stuff I've read where. Um, Somebody will say like, well, my agent wouldn't want to go on that mission. And it's like, okay, yeah, it's a volunteer organization. Make a character who would. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Because there's probably somebody in a file somewhere that's going to go into that. I mean, the framework is pretty easy to like determine why, like why a character would go in there, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think that is personally, I'm, I'm of the opinion that like you need to have a good hook, both in a story wise and within the party for why people were working together because I hate, I love character drama, mm-hmm. but I hate, I hate premise rejection. 
Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. that's what it is where it's like, I don't want to go on the adventure. And I'm like, then why are we playing the game? Uh, right. Right. And that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I think, um, like, making a character for this type of game, uh, you we created, what, a, a journalist, uh, a doctor, and... A uh, historian, mm-hmm. so it would make sense that the GM would be like, "All right, well, what what would those three profession uh, professions go on? What what sort of mission yeah. can I send them on?" Not like, "Well, you're you're three regular people that don't know how to use firearms too well. Uh, we're going to send you in the middle of a war zone with Cthulhu's like minions. Yeah, uh, good good luck with that." Yeah, like if I was <laughs> like if I was taking these three characters and running it, I'm, I, I'd be like something like. Okay, maybe you maybe there's been a weird outbreak somewhere that is showing unusual mutations in its victims, or there's some or there's something related there's something related to like, you know, oh hey, there's the there's a weird ancient virus that's popped back up or something. And and you know, that's what mm-hmm. that's like something I could see them going on. Uh um, mm-hmm. yeah. You know, it's I think that's a that's a strength of the system is that not every situation, like, there is a lot of investigation and talking and looking into clues as part of this game, and it doesn't need to end with, or the end-all be-all of p- player functionality is not pointing a gun at something and pulling the trigger until it's hit mm-hmm. points at zero. Yeah, exactly. And it also seems like the answer is not always like, well, someone summoned Cthulhu! Like. Yeah. Like, there are other things going on that's yeah. like, well, we don't know, like, where this virus came from, but it is potentially something supernatural. But the, like, mission itself is not kill the giant supernatural being. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, there's there's more happening. The There's a, there's a free uh, supplement, which is sort of like the beginner's box for the game. And it has a standard, it has a sample adventure. And the adventure is just... A Delta agent, a Delta Green agent died, and you have to go clean up his house. Mm. And you just have to go clean it up, secure anything, and remove any trace of the unnatural. And it's a mm. it like it sounds really, and it's really simple on the tin, but it is, it's a really good, um, at least premise of like you know this can start from really anywhere. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. I love that. How do you think going through the process of character creation in this game reinforces the feel of the game? How does it give you a sense of what's going to happen? Hmm. Um, because I think that you are you you're making well adjusted you're making like semi well adjusted adults to go send them to the slaughter. Um, I think that like it's really in that back half of like why are you doing this? Why are you doing it? Like, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. what have you been exposed to before? Maybe even. Like that's getting you like saying, okay, what has been the past experience with this and preparing you for it? Um, but it's also like that that part where you're picking your job and stuff. I'd say, okay, what are you planning to do with this character, and sort of what are you expecting? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can I can see like uh, as at least as a group creating the characters, the different types of characters that you create as a group are going to determine kind of what sort of stories you're going to be able to play. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Because you know you're working for an organization and that's going to be sending out agents based on their talents, right? So it it would make sense where they go. And that kind of gives me a little bit of an expectation of what sort of things are we're going to be doing as a group. But it's also um, like you don't really get a sense of what the game's about until that last few questions, right? I feel like when you get to the motivations, that really like, like, why on earth would you do this? Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know, you might die. It's very clear that you're going to go crazy. Like, what? Why? Why? I think that like maybe... that's sort of like a realistic depiction of Delta Green of like everything is normal until you dive off the cliff. But at the same time, I don't think right. that's the best way of preparing people. No. Yeah. <laughs> it's fair. So what do you think then is one of the biggest flaws of character creation in this system? And what, what do you think is one of your best uh, parts about it? I mean, I'm not a huge fan of deep percentile systems, but <laughs> that's I... One of those things is also like um, I am 
a core mechanic is not the end all be all of my stuff. Like I'll play a D20 game. It doesn't matter like if if there's mm-hmm. an interesting thing going on there. Um yeah. I think that yeah, the the isolation of like character creation from the supernatural elements until really the end of it, like it doesn't really there isn't really a sense of what player expectations should be. Mm-hmm. Um like they're which I think is part of just like sort of, I think it's a little bit of a product of its line, of its like design lineage mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. where it's not quite it's not quite trying to reinforce genre and expectations through character creation but instead making a wholesale human being mm-hmm. who is then going to have things done to them yeah it, yeah it doesn't give me a good sense of like what's like optimal right yeah for for like my character type or whatever aside from here's the skills that you're good at now pick eight new skills that you're also f- semi good at and then like well what do i pick uh, do i i, I pick swimming for one of my skills right yeah. and i'm like swimming's useful right and 20 percent seems kind of low if you're going to need to roll to swim so so maybe uh but like i, I have no idea yeah, I think one of the things that, like, I didn't talk about this at all during character creation, but there, are um, you know, this is one of those games where unless you are doing something challenged or in, like, a time-sensitive manner or where there's a degree of difficulty, you never ro- you're never really rolling. Um, okay. Like, any skill that you could sort of quantify as, like, a knowledge skill, you can basically use anything as a knowledge skill in Delta Green. Like, um... I could use firearms as a knowledge skill to like identify like, oh, hey, you know, this round is all like these rounds are only made in Germany. You know, for mm-hmm. example, yeah. it's like, you know, if I have like, you know, a certain level of proficiency in it or, you know, as my doctor has like a 50 in pharmacy, I'm going to be like, yeah, I know what this drug does off the top of my head. Um, right. Yeah. And so, yeah, like that, there's like that assumed competency from doing stuff. But like, yeah, having a 20 in swim, what does that mean? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Which I think is a default and a fault of most percentile based systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Do I start? Is 50% average? Like people, you know, like, eh? I mean, Uh, if you didn't know about that, 50% swimming, it's like, well, 50% of the time I'm just going to drown. Like, right. (laughs) Yeah. That doesn't seem fair. Just keep me away from the water. (laughs) Now now we're getting into like old video game territory where you fall in the water and you're dead because they Mm -hmm. don't have the mechanics to actually get out of the water. Yep. Yep. No, I mean, I, it's like to some degree, I, I like, so it's just really, do I want to know what I'm getting into going into it? Like, I feel like for me, part of the fun of horror is like. Not knowing what's going to happen. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think this is where, like, we, you know, an important part of horror games, especially is a is a healthy session zero where you're talking about expectations and managing those as Mm -hmm. well as i'm normally with delta green i'm running a one shot because you know it's fast it's quick i'm working off like a 500 page pre-written scenario or 500 word pre-written scenario Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. and you know it's a matter of hey what are some subjects that are you know not that are off the table you know stuff like that but like you know i'll usually give like a two or three minute spiel about what to expect from Delta Green, you know, sort mm-hmm. of the 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 fic- the rule, not the rules, but like the the fictional expectations of the universe. Like, you mm-hmm. know, yeah. oh hey, this is it's not a James Bond setting; it's a Jason Bourne setting. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. And even then, it's even lower than that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think expectations are are key for any game but especially for a horror game and especially for a horror game with any level of lethality yeah exactly setting setting that up for people is yeah important um and i i don't think the game does that itself Mm -hmm. but yeah it's one of those things where it's like oh hey 
zero doesn't mean you're unconscious. Zero means you were dead. Um, Mm -hmm. Like two means you're unconscious, you're down. Um, Which, and that's before we even get into stuff like there are lethality rules uh, for stuff like automatic weapons and grenades, which can like are a simple like if you roll under a flat number and you do not have any mitigating factors, a character is dead. Mm -hmm. Um, which is like, it's a brutality that is not present in many modern games. And Mm -hmm. so it's Mm -hmm. like, it's something that I'm always like, if somebody, if somebody's character sheet has a submachine gun on it, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to like say like, Hey, this is how lethality works real quick. You know, not easily a huge problem, but like, you know, it it is, it's a game that tries to represent the fact that a single gunshot can kill you. Um, Like Mm -hmm. not always, but like it has that potential. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's something that, like, I have played with a lot of people who would not be okay with that. Yeah, exactly. Like, that, you know, something so simple can kill you. They'd be like, no, that's not, like, uh-uh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and you need to be aware. And to, ta- and to loop back on, like, our sanity conversation, the stuff like, there is a certain expectation in RPGs that, like, you know, I can do violence without having to really think about it. Um, mm-hmm. and, and like, especially if it is justified within the character's head. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, I don't, I don't want to go into like the whole spiel of it, but the idea of like being in a firefight is at least a stressful situation. Yeah. Um, is like, why don't we talk about that more in game? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I know because some of it is just a power yeah, fantasy kind like, of a thing, yeah, but a, I, I do think there are more games where it's like, mm, do we want to talk about that? Like. What I think about that was like the uh, like the unmasking and L5R2 that it's like, this is just stressful. Mm -hmm. It's okay to like have a little bit of a meltdown because like I've never seen a ghost before, you know, like that would mess me up. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I like when there's mechanics for that. I think, yeah, like there's (laughs) like I, I'm a, I'm actually like a big fan of like stress mechanics. Like I'm, I'm a, I'm a big fan of masks and like, you know, conditions and mm-hmm. blowing off conditions through, through like fulfilling narrative function, like through, through fulfilling narrative requirements and playing mm-hmm. into genre is something that I love. Um, yeah. And like, I, you know, it's not something I need in every game, but like more, and, but I'm somebody who likes to get into a dramatic space. Uh, you know, it's like, I'm a theater kid. I like to do that. Um, you know, and it's like it lets you tell more complex stories too, yeah. which again I know is not for everybody. Some people are like, I just want to hit it with. A sword. Or some people cool. don't even want rules to deal with. Like the, some people are very particular about like I don't want a rule to tell me how I feel. Which mm-hmm. yeah, I respect that. I mm-hmm. you know I trust that game designers usually know what they're doing, and so it's like if there's mm-hmm. a rule telling me how to feel or how a rule how like a rule telling me how my character's like stress or reactions can be affected i'll play into that sure i you know it's a game Mm -hmm. um i I think it also indicates to you that like this is a thing that is important to the genre and a thing that should come up in your game Mm -hmm. you know whether you choose to like actively use those rules or not it does mean that the designer has said this is something that should come up Mm -hmm. and i think that alone is important too right yeah What's your favorite? What's your favorite part? Favorite part of building character, like building characters in this game. Honestly, I like especially when I'm like, uh, as, like looking through the list of like various agencies and finding weird stuff to make characters around. Because like as somebody who like is mostly running the game, um, you know, it's like why would this character ever get called into an operation? I love that feeling. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah. also like trying to figure out like weird people who are like you know I've worked. I worked several jobs. I know that there are weird people who end up there. Um, mm-hmm. Like, I think that they're like something that we're something that I'm dodging around is also that like there's a lot of potential to be cops in this game, and mm-hmm. while that's not mm-hmm. very interesting to me, like they're like they're they exist, and creating characters within that framework of like why are they here? Why do they care about like this specific thing? Um, mm-hmm. yeah. Is interesting to me. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. I do really like the exploration of like, how did you end up in this job? Like, 
Because I think that even about myself, it's like if you had asked me, you know, whatever, like 15 years ago, what I would be doing for a living, like, this is not it. Right. That's fine. I like what I do, but like not where I thought I would end Mm -hmm. up. Uh, And so I do like exploring, you know, what weird set of circumstances and skills got you here. Mm -hmm. There, there's a, there's an additional book that just like talks about a bunch of agencies and stuff. And like, there, there there's like, there's a profile like there was for like doctor for like playing an IRS analyst. Oh, because it's like, Hey, evil cults or corporations that are using the unnatural still have to like do accounting. (laughs) Right. Right. And mm-hmm. are they pretending to be a church so they can be tax free? Because I'm not about that. <laughs> uh. Yeah. Okay. The part we've all been waiting for. <laughs> Our favorite part of the show. Fanfic. Fan fiction. Heck yeah. What is this group of characters doing? Like, what? What are we doing? Um. I, I mean, I, I, I like I is like as the the person who's run this. Like, I would say like we are probably going to like a you know some delta green analyst has like in in a very in a in a cubicle in washington dc somewhere has like tagged like oh hey there's this weird outbreak of stuff that has that is correlating with some search terms that are in like a historical database somewhere like you know to go into like the thing that uh you know, maybe it's something like from like Roanoke or something, you know, because that because horror plots know like three catastrophes uh, For sure. in history. Um, and, you know, I was thinking, too, I'm like, what if it is like just like this weird strain of like the bubonic plague? Yeah. Like we've never said like we thought that was gone. This looks like that, but it's doing weird. Stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And maybe there's a relation to like the deep ones or ghouls you know it could be mm-hmm. a number of things like and there's there's always the thing of delta of the mythos of you can make something up it just right. fits within a certain genre mm-hmm. and like mm-hmm. you know it would probably be like oh hey we're you know all three of us get like some sort of email or random call like you know it's like oh hey you've been invited to a business conference and then you get a tail and we're all we all end up in we're in some like small office or motel in the middle of nowhere and some guy in a suit (laughs) gives us a file like that's Mm -hmm. that's that's how i imagine it happens that's how most Mm -hmm. delta green operations start yep i want to know how ryan is here like i feel like yeah like, I have a specialty in conspiracy theories mm-hmm. and, like, history. And we have a doctor. Why is this local newscaster who is threatening to uncover every story <laughs> invited into this secret organization? Um, I I put down, uh, like, why does Delta Green trust your agent uh, and keep uh, trust your agent to confront the threats and keep it secret is uh, my journalistic integrity. Mm-hmm. Um, like, even though, like, I want to uncover the truth, I've still got, like, a very, like, core set of, like, ways that I go about my work. And, like, I, I never give up a source. I, uh, you know, I I do things by the book. And mm-hmm. uh, when I give my word, that's my word. And, and it never falters sort of thing, right? You're an adorably ethical journalist. Yeah. Right? I mean, you've probably been read into some stuff that is beyond eyes only uh, clearances. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, that's uh, interesting. I, I like that. I, I, won- I wonder if I'm brought on to, to, to kind of document it, right? To document all of this for mm. Delta Green's eyes specifically and only. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, one of the things that's very interesting about Delta Green is that just about any approach you could take to the unnatural, you can find some character or faction within there to support it. Mm-hmm. Like the, yeah. the most hardline traditional stance of Delta Green is burn everything. Right. And be and like and don't recover alien technology because it's going to be always hazardous. But then there mm-hmm. are people who like we need to study what we need to prevent to prevent the apocalypse. Yeah. Um, and so, like, documentation is maybe something of, like, hey, 
we need we we can at least use these keywords and searches and stuff so that we can prevent other stuff. So I yeah, that's definitely interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I also love the idea of you being the person that makes all their training videos. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm very into that. Oh, I, yeah, because like I'm very personable, right? A- April is like this, like really extremely personable uh, individual, like even though they're mm-hmm. like, you know, at, at the very least local famous. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, They're very approachable and like somebody that you you want to have a conversation with. Um, yeah. and, and so like kind of being the face of these like internal delta green training videos is kind of hilarious yeah and mm-hmm. and like you're like and being a journalist means you're a good investigator which means that you're yeah. going to be able to like you can get into places and a journalist asking questions will elicit a different response than an fbi agent or a u.s marshal asking questions definitely very true definitely yeah especially like if people are like freaked out and worried about something mm-hmm. they're you probably they're much more likely to go to like a journalist and be like, I need to tell the story because yeah. people need to know. And you're like, great. Or or yeah, I even will not tell them. Yeah, even going <laughs> to people uh and saying, you know, I'm a journalist, I've got integrity, this you you can be a completely anonymous source. Like the general public know about journalistic integrity and know that like, hey, if I say I don't want to be named or mentioned then I know it's going to be an anonymous source and nobody's going to give me up on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like, Definitely. you know, if you, if you got somebody that's trustworthy uh, asking the questions, then, mm-hmm. you know, people are going to be more likely to tell you the truth. Oh yeah, absolutely. You just have like a trustworthy face, yeah. you know, like you just seem like somebody that I can get along with. Yeah. Perfect. Just pick her up and put her on your shoulder and, have somebody she's small yeah just super small super small pocket size <laughs> uh. okay let's get into our discussion on advancement and take it up a level take it up a level take it up a level so in this segment we talk about character advancement and also character growth mm-hmm. so how does a character level up in delta green and how does that character change mechanically when it happens? So there, um, it is a it is a non leveling system. There is no experience points that uh, are gained in the system. Um, mm-hmm. If you look on the character sheet, you'll notice that there are tick boxes next to every skill. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you attempt a skill and you have a non zero value in it, um, even if it's the base value that's like the 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 standard value that's in brackets. Um, and you fail it, you just check the box. At the end of every session, you clear all your boxes and you add one to the skill of any uh, skill that you checked a box for. It's, you know, it's you just like when you do, when you try something and fail, you get better at it. Mm-hmm. Um, that is how that's like sort of the most common way. There's also mm-hmm. character growth. Um Though growth is a very open-ended term because after you finish a investigation and you're done, you go home. And yes. um, between sessions, you have sort of interstitial scenes at home where you clear, basically clear off the deck. So if you had bonds that were damaged or broken during the um, during the investigation, um, mm-hmm. you can ha- you might have to replace, you might have to spend your home scene trying to repair those bonds. Um, alternatively, you might be like, you might be going to the hospital to recover hit points if you were badly hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the other options is that hilarious, that not hilariously, but like it's a game, it's not an option in many games, or at least as a mechanical option, you can go to therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, Love it because you know this is a game that is about trauma, and you're talking. To, you can talk to your therapist about the fact that you had a very rough investigation where you dealt with things that man is not supposed that humanity is not supposed to know. Mm-hmm. The big tipping point for that is: Are you honest with your therapist about what you saw? Because mm-hmm. if you lie your therapist can tell you're lying to them and maybe it's not as effective. And if you tell them the truth, you've just created a new vector for the unnatural. 
and mm. you've put that person in danger. Uh, also, it feels like they're more likely to commit you. Yeah. Um, right? Why wouldn't, like, why wouldn't Delta Green have therapists on hand specifically? For um, because Delta Green is not... because uh, Well, part of it is that Delta Green is not really... The, the, the secret is that even if it's the government sanctioned program and not just this ragtag group of outlaws, is that mm-hmm. it's a much smaller organization than anyone is led to believe. It's just oh. a bunch of analysts and case officers with a limited budget. Oh, no. That is stealing from other departments and creating joint task forces out of it. Like, there is no actual Delta Green. In, there are very few actual Delta Green employees. It's all yeah. stolen from other departments to cover its tracks. Oh, wow. Um, which is how at least some black budget uh, organizations work. Um, it's. You know, I just feel like if I told my therapist that, like, I saw Cthulhu, she'd be like, are you manic right now? Are you like, we would start getting questions about like, how are you sleeping? Are you eating right now? Yeah. It's like, it's like you can like there, there's like literally in the home section. It is you, re- you like, if you're telling the truth, you risk causing sanity loss to your therapist. And if mm-hmm. your therapist thinks that you are a danger to someone, she can like, they might call the authorities. Mm. Um, which is like, it, it makes this this whole thing. There are other things you can also do when you're in your home scene, um, yeah. which includes <laughs> stuff like, you know, you can try to like train a skill while you're there. Mm-hmm. Um, or you can even like stay studying the case. Like maybe you stole some files and took them home. Uh, or you're trying to like, you've got like this encrypted flash drive with a bunch of rituals on it. And you're trying to study this. Mm-hmm. Um which, you know, are all various ways that the character can grow of like, hey, I want to raise that unnatural stat because I want to know more about the supernatural supernatural mm. and the things that are out there. Um other ways characters can grow is they can get fired or prosecuted. Um like you might have maybe because you needed to get weapon like maybe you needed to take down some monster, you stole weapons from lockup. Um, and like, you know, like there's entire things for like doing things that trigger an internal investigation and Mm -hmm. the, the I love how much just like straight up bureaucracy this game has, which like, I feel like really lends to the horror element also. Um, like (laughs) like there is a specific, there's a specific horror that comes from everything having a rule and the, the massive inertia of government um right and i think there's something to be said for like i as a character i'm like i gotta do something now like that i need this handled and somebody being like mm, but you do submit that form in triplicate and being like i we, we have like there's a sense of urgency on something and the government being like we'll get back to you in four to six weeks. yeah mm-hmm. and- and of course, the the thing of you can't tell people what you're doing, really, like you've always got a right. cover story. And if that cover story ends in gunfire, how will you be able to clean it up? Because, yeah, yeah. You know, and so there's all these things going to happen to fall to fall out. And, you know, if I'm running a one shot, I can like sort of like summarize something that might happen. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe you know, depending on the mood of the session, give it a happier, sad ending. But like, you mm-hmm. know, in an ongoing game, it's very possible that like, you know, you like your your investigation caught the local sheriff who's maybe called your supervisor and is like, hey, mm-hmm. you know, this person is da, 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 da. and it's like, really, I thought they were supposed to be in Massachusetts for a uh, conference, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like, you know, Oops. stuff goes on there. So. Like there's this whole other section of it of things that can happen in the aftermath that all sort of count as character growth. It's just not mm-hmm. always the character growth you want. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's really it's interesting because I'm like looking through some of these things in the home section and like stay on the case um, where you kind of try to come to terms with uh, what happened in the case. You you roll a d6 minus three to add to your your sanity, <laughs> which can- and which can be negative. Yeah. 
it, which is which is really interesting. So either you come to terms with it and like you get some reprieve that some of that emotional stress goes away, or you are just over obsessing and 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 you lose some of that. You get more stressed out because of it. Yeah, yeah. it is. It's really like I think one of the things the game does incredibly well is show like even though you are doing something that is, I would say, like, objectively good, which is trying to at least delay the apocalypse by a week. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is that it is incredibly taxing. Um, and th you never get any, like, that. this is the thing of, like, unlike other games, there's no rewards at the end of the mission. Um, yeah. Like, there's yeah. no, there's no gold coins. There's no magic armor. Um, it's that there's, you know, dead bodies to clean up um, mm -hmm. and a lot of paperwork to do and probably like emotional yeah, trauma, it, it events, emotional trauma. It is a bunch of broken people trying to save the world and making bad decisions, mm -hmm. um, which is very interesting. And it's why I find this game so intriguing, even if it is yeah. like you know, like I said, it's a problematic thing. Uh, I like there's mm -hmm. there's easy ways you can take this game into places that are probably like uncomfortable or unhealthy. But I think like mm -hmm. with a good group, like I've like I joked about this earlier, whale graffiti can happen. Um, mm -hmm. right. Like you can take it from there, or you can do stuff that is like you know, end of the world stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Or or ramp it up. Yeah, you know get start off like super weird and basic and and get extremely cosmic with it yeah over time yeah i mean i think as long as you are having those conversations at the beginning about what people are okay with what the expectations are your lines your veils like all of that kind of stuff i think there's a lot of potential here to have like a really good um meaningful game and i like that it can be serious i love serious yeah games. they're like aren't enough of them um but i like games that deal with like a lot of that emotional stuff that's something that i really mm -hmm. love mm -hmm. and i i feel like this does that absolutely yeah it's it's the only game where i found a party wipe satisfying <laughs> yeah yeah like i, I can I, also as, as a player as a player <laughs> okay <Right. laughs> I, I i can easily see this working as kind of like a uh a uh, almost an entourage of different characters that you can pick from, right? Mm -hmm. That yeah. like, uh, okay, we're only three players, but you know, I've got six different characters to choose from, mm -hmm. and depending mm -hmm. on what characters you're choosing to play together, that's the type of missions you're going to go on. Yeah, yeah, it's which would be really cool. Yeah, it's a fun way that you can sort of like play <laughs> with the idea of like shifting characters or stuff of like, okay, we like you know shifting genre or expectations even based on the characters you're doing there because it's like our group is going to look a lot different from like an fbi agent a cia analyst and yeah. an army ranger yeah right exactly uh i could i could also even see like uh two sessions happening simultaneously like one group you're playing like the down in the the ditches with the the weapons and everything and the other groups like trying to investigate and they're kind of con trying to converge there, to a single point of the story there is um, a scenario i think it's called the star chamber which is an official scenario written for it you play two you play two groups of characters one is your agents who are presiding over an inquiry of other delta green agents and mm. you and what happens is that everybody else gets assigned a second character so you play that mm -hmm. character in flashbacks. And, oh, interesting. Oh. And the and like even like the character stats change based on who is narrating at that point. Oh, it's that's so cool. I, one of the things that I truly love about this game is like there are it's it's really fascinating what people come up with in terms of yeah. uh, like narrative structures and stuff. Uh, there like they there's a contest that gets held every year called shotgun scenarios which are delta green scenarios that have a 500 word count limit i believe mm -hmm. and they're mm -hmm. just like they're fun to read and stuff there's one that is 
um, about, it's called the button, um, which the idea of it is, is that through happenstance, uh, a programming student finds a circuit that is mythos related, that they build a little tube with a light and a button, and the light will always light up a second before you press the button. Mm. And the entire the entire frame of this is that you cannot avoid this. This is how it happens. If the light goes on, you're going to press the button. And like, if you say like, I'm going to wait for it to light up, but I'm not going to press the button, it'll never light up. And it's like going with the cosmic idea, cosmic horror stuff of like, there is no free will. There's no free will. It's all, you know, it's all, it's like stuff like that. It's just like, this is weird. And like, you know, if you keep (laughs) playing with it, you keep beating sanity into it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's just like there's so much it's it's really the thing that keeps me interested in this game, even like as like where Call of Cthulhu doesn't of like that people find all this weird stuff and like mm-hmm. there's stuff based on like uh you know like modern day cults, uh venture capital, like there's even like a a, a group of bad guys in one of the books that poses a fertility clinic. Um, mm-hmm. and it's all just like stuff of like capturing like stuff out there in the news and twisting up, which I find just yeah. really fascinating. And it's, it's a weird game. It's a problem. It's it, it, not a perfect game, but it's an interesting one. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And I just love the like varying scale that you can play mm-hmm. this at that. It's just like, sometimes it's just like, this stuff is like weird. Like, mm-hmm, it's a, yeah. like, it's a weird fit, you know, something that you would read in some, like, weird Twitter thread or something yeah. that you're like, huh, that's strange. And then it's like, oh, no, there's, like, so much more to it. But also it can be the end of the world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the game handles all of that really well, that it's it's it scales that way, that not a lot of games do yeah, that. Yeah, the, the sort of simplicity of, like, characters and the system itself mm-hmm. sort of does give you this open ended structure of like, you're going to just slot these characters in. It's up to mm-hmm. the storyteller and the players up to the characters and the storyteller to figure out how big this is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, well, uh, that was so good. Uh, Justin, thank you so much for joining us to talk about Delta green. It was my um, immense pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> can you remind everyone where they can find you online and uh here's where you can plug all those sorts of things that you've been working on all right yeah so um i do the complete discography podcast which um is a terry pratchett Discworld world read through show that occasionally dips into other fantasy like uh the lock tomb um you can find that at to an underscore pod i also do the babylon project which originally did babylon 5 and is now uh doing a watch through a person of interest, um, secretly the best cyberpunk show of the 21st century. Um, <laughs> and that is at Babylon Project. Um, you can also find me on Gatecrashers, which is gatecrashers.fan, where I do writing about comics, television, wrestling, and whatever they let me do. Um, honestly, they, <laughs> they give me too long a leash. <laughs> Um, and you can also find me on Twitter at Justin Wrights. That's J U S T E N. Um, where I have uh ADHD about whatever I'm hyper focusing on at the time. Enjoy. Oh, there you go. <laughs> mm-hmm. Look, we love a good ADHD tweet. Yeah. Sometimes I just have thoughts about things, and I just need people to know: is it relevant? No. But if I shout it into the void. It cannot be in my brain. Mm-hmm. And that's good. Thanks, Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again for sitting down with us to do this. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Call to action. Yeah, like that. I'm really excited that we finally got to cover Delta Green. I know it's been on yeah. our list for a long time. I know that we covered Call of Cthulhu last year. And this this obviously does have a lot of similarities. Um, yeah. But I, I do really like that we got to cover kind of like this more modern version. Um, yeah. And I, I like that we got to dig into some of the like to 
dig into the sanity mechanics. And, you know, in this most recent yeah. episode, we got to kind of talk about some of the fan space stuff around this game, which was also really cool. I think if we look back on our, like, documents of games we want to cover and people that suggested things to cover, this might have gone back ages for when Justin first suggested, yeah, I can do Delta Green with yeah. you guys. I think, um, I, I mean, I think, I feel like they suggested it pretty early on. And, and yeah. certainly, like, they were always the person that I, I wanted to go to for this. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited that we, we finally got to do this one. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it and was really again, great. again, in our spooky month, so. I um, know. I'm really excited. Um, I, I've got ideas for next year's spooky month. Um, it's fun covering spooky games in October. It's a nice little tradition that we got started. Yeah, I really. Um, I was thinking about it. I was like, I would really love to do another kind of Christmassy winter game um, mm-hmm. in December, too. So if somebody has a game that they've they've written and they would like to cover or that they know of, um, yeah. let us know. Because I, I, I kind of like doing these little seasonal they are fun. games um especially if we can cover something that has some more unique mechanics and mm-hmm. stuff like that i think that'll make it a lot more uh worthwhile as well so yeah definitely uh, we'll, we'll definitely keep an eye out for things mm-hmm. uh, and see what happens absolutely well before we let you go for our end of the month break we do have uh some announcements and calls to action First, a quick reminder that the Kickstarter for Rebels of the Outlaw Waste is still going on for about another two-ish weeks um, around Mm -hmm. the release of this episode. I didn't want to do the exact math. (laughs) So (laughs) two-ish weeks. Um, Uh They've already met their funding goal and their first stretch goal, but they have several more waiting. Um, Most of them are for additional custom worlds for the game, and those would be so awesome to see. I would be really excited to see what kind of stuff they have going there. Absolutely. Um, So we will put a link to that in our newly streamlined show notes. Um, If you want to hear more about that game, you can check out our most recent Spotlight episode, too. Uh, We had a lot of fun with the system. Yeah, it was so much fun. Uh, Speaking of newly streamlined, uh, Mm. next up, a few notes about our move to Megaphone for the One Shot Network. Uh, now, for those that know, uh, we used to be on Simplecast, um, and then the network decided uh, to move things to Megaphone uh, for a number of reasons. So we'll we'll get into a little bit of what that means right now and what that means going forward. So yeah, so just a quick note that these are this is a little bit longer than our, our usual call yeah. to action, um, but we just kind of want to explain to everybody what's going to keep you in the loop. Absolutely. Uh, So what this means is that uh, once the ad network is fully set up, ads will start playing for some folks at the beginning of the show and right now, right before the credits of the show. So we're trying not to interrupt any of the actual content Mm -hmm. of the episodes. Uh, So we're we're trying to do that and keep that in mind for everybody. Uh, For now, we have two ad slots in each of those places. I think they're 30 seconds each. Mm -hmm. Uh, So at most a minute uh, interruption at those places. There also might be room for network ads at the very end of the show. So if you want to hear about other shows on the network, um, their show ads will randomly shovel into each episode uh, once that is set up. Um, So it'll be blurbs about the other shows recorded by the cast of those shows. Yeah, so in the past, we've kind of been tagging those on to the end of our episodes, and I'm sure you've heard them on all of the network shows. Um, yeah. Because that's, that's, you know, part of our network agreement. Um, you know, if you enjoyed this show, check out whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, we will all kind of be reading our own now, and those will get slotted into that, that last spot. Um, I believe the plan is also to use them potentially to announce, like, cool things that are happening on the network Mm -hmm. um you know like if there are twitch streams coming up or if somebody on the network has a new game coming out um if james has another book um or jeff and john have a book or something like that coming Mm out um that kind of stuff will go in there too so that's kind of that's kind of fun yeah uh, we're definitely going to be playing around with it so uh we'll, we'll see what we can do and what we can't do uh, and and try to make it as good of experience as we can for everybody. Mm-hmm. So we'll be playing around with those settings to ensure that it's it's the least intrusive experience. We know that like having ads and things, you know, it's it's nobody's favorite. Um, mm-hmm. 
but we 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 do know that it'll um it'll it'll really help support the things that we're doing it'll help support the network there are a few people on the network that that do this as a job so this will help support them too and Mm -hmm. um ideally in the future it'll it'll make it so that we can do some more cool things too yeah absolutely we have blocked 63 different categories of ads so far mm-hmm. that we just didn't feel good about advertising on the show. Um, so things like military stuff, um, Ryan and I, for our you know personal reasons, blocked anything related to alcohol. Um, we blocked things like weight loss, um, kind of anything that we felt might be you mm-hmm. know triggering or problematic for anybody. Yeah. Um, there there are categories in there that are listed as other. Um, so we don't know exactly what will be in there. If you come across something that you don't agree with or you don't feel like meets the standards of the network or the standards and values of our show, please mm-hmm. let us know. Uh, the ad spots are individualized. Um, so different people are getting different ads. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the word for that. But so... We don't necessarily, like, it's not like I can pull up the episode and hear the ad that you heard. So mm-hmm. uh, if you hear something that, that again, like I said, doesn't match the values that we you think our show holds or even that you hold, please let us know. Um, mm-hmm. And we can, we'll do what we can. Yep, absolutely. Uh, we don't know when ads will start filling in for folks because we're kind of still working out all the kinks and, and getting everything mm-hmm. moved over. You might only get one ad out of the four spots available uh between the opener and that that mid roll right before the credits uh, mm-hmm. you might get none you might get all four it depends on what the algorithm decides the yes, almighty the, algorithm <laughs> exactly uh but in addition to the ad stuff uh, we did end up losing a bit of accessibility uh in the move uh if you get served an ad the timestamps in the show notes are not going to be as accurate anymore uh, which is really unfortunate. Uh, in addition, uh, uploading episodes to Megaphone strips them of any chapter markers in the MP3 itself. Uh, so we've lost chaptering on services like Boom. Apple Podcasts and Pocket Casts, which I'm very annoyed by, but there's literally no workaround for it. Uh, but services like Podcast Addict on Android will still have chaptering uh, since they dynamically create chapters based on the show notes timestamps which is really cool um another thing that bummed me out as well is uh show notes now have a four thousand character limit um i know (laughs) amelia is laughing at me i have been rolling Uh, my (laughs) eyes and his frustration about this dear listeners because our show notes are so long they are very so long and i know that like i they are thorough um, but also it kind of makes it hard to find the information because you have to Ooh. scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. And I know, so, I, I know that they're in, eh, before you say it, I know that they have headers. I know that they're always in the same order. I know the information is always in the same place. Uh-huh. However, if I am not the uh-huh. person that checks the show notes on every single episode, I don't remember exactly what that order is. That's fair. Um, uh, so, so th- <laughs> to, to uh, Amelia's delight, we are going to be streamlining <laughs> the show notes. Um, quite a bit to to make room for those four thousand characters, um, and and make sure that we don't go over that limit in the future, uh, if we happen to get a little too verbose in the introduction uh, to the episode. So, I I love. Um, I think this is like the different versions of accessibility, right? Is that like for you, accessibility is like I have all of the information at my fingertips. I have these timestamps so that I can get to where uh-huh. I want to go. And for me, I'm like I have ADHD. Please just give me the information I need. Yep. I don't need all of this. Um, yeah, so we'll, fi- we'll figure you know, it out. We'll find, we're going to find the balance between, as usual, yeah. um, we are going to find the balance between the magical girl and the necromancer, between the fire and water. Um, yeah. it's, it's somewhere in there. It's somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in there. In there. Um, yeah. And, and uh, Megaphone is going to force us to find that spot. I know. And that's fine. <laughs> uh, we, we also lost built-in transcripts on the episodes, too, which I'm uh, not too happy about but that just means we need to find another place to host the transcribed episodes Mm -hmm. um so that way people can still get to them even if it's just uh an easy link to click in the show notes who knows yeah um we may just like have a a link to where they are in our dropbox or um potentially maybe eventually like host them on our website or something like that Mm -hmm. so 
uh, we'll, we'll find a way. Um, Simple cast let us just like tack it in there as like an additional field that we could put transcripts yep. in. And unfortunately, no, no, no luck on that one. No. Uh, so finally, the the final note on all of this, <laughs> um, patrons will still get ad free episodes for all of the new content. We are looking at the possibility of having an ad free feed of normal episodes for patrons so that would be the episodes that have the cold open and mm. this call to action and like the music and you know all that like the full production um right now though you can get access to ad free episodes through those early release episodes um anything yeah. that we put out in our feed that is an early release doesn't have those ads inserted yet because it it gets inserted when we put it into the main feed yes so again, all of this is pretty new to us. We just kind of wanted to be upfront about what some of these changes are um, because we really care about the quality of the show and everything in in front of the scenes and behind the scenes. And mm -hmm. we kind of like to let people know what's going on and, and how, yeah. how the sausage is made. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, what is nice is this... Again, it'll help supplement our Patreon, gets us closer to affording to do this show without having to pay anything out of pocket. Mm -hmm. Ideally, will help us um, be able to to bring you new and interesting content too, because mm -hmm. we'll, we'll have the funds to do some of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, we, we don't know what that is yet, but we can dream. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one additional announcement uh, currently. Over on the One Shot Podcast Network Secret Archive, uh, their $5 and up Patreon level, uh, you can find the first episode of the new sci-fi fantasy adventure campaign starring uh, James and Mel D'Amato, uh, Drew Merzieski and Allie Grower. Um, it's called Starwall, Odyssey of the Lucky Finn. It's fantastic. Uh, and I am editing the campaign. Uh, with some truly inspired synth music, if I do say so myself. It is Amazing. fantastic. Oh, it's so good. Uh, episode zero is out now with uh, episode one proper right around the corner. So uh, definitely check that out if you're a patron over there um, or, or dip in there after a bit to, to grab those episodes because goodness gracious, uh, hilarious. And consider through becoming through. a patron. If you're not exactly. just to get access to this this whole other show, it's so good. It's so good. I can't wait to edit more of it. And well, and like they they all like have such good chemistry. I played yep. a game of Descent into Midnight with James Mel, <sighs> Ali, and Drew oh. um, back at 2018 Gen Con, and yeah. it was such a fantastic experience. Rich Howard was running the game for us. Like, oh, like I, wow! I, I know. I know. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I know uh, published author TV's James D'Amato, personally. I am thoroughly uh, jealous <laughs> of that great. table. My <laughs> Lord. Um, speaking of Patreon, um, in addition to bonus episodes that won't appear anywhere else, um, at the $5 and up level for our Patreon, I guess we should clarify, this is for ours yes. now, um, as well as bonus outtakes and our new character creation chit chat segments that we put out for all of our patron patrons, mm -hmm. uh, not to mention exclusive chat rooms in the C3 Discord. Um, we would like to take just a moment to thank our current patrons for helping to support everything that we're doing here. Absolutely. Uh, first up uh, and first patron, Lieutenant, thank you. Uh, David, a.k.a. Tigranosaurus, thank you so much for your support. Eric Bontz, we appreciate your support. Thank you. Matt Newton, thanks. Shadim Cabal, we're happy to have you here with us. Thank you. Daryl Holiday II, you rock. Thank you so much. We appreciate your support. The shyest barbarian, thank you. And honestly, thank you for that excellent Animorphs meme. <laughs> <laughs> So good. It won't be last night by the time this comes out, but um, it made my day and I cackled very loudly. <laughs> um, Benjamin Sweeney, thank you so much for your support. Uh, many thanks to Lorcan McInnes. Rob Fletcher, uh, we appreciate your support so much. Thank you. And we appreciate your support. Kevin Brown, thank you. 
And we are glad to have you, Tentacle Duck. Oh, God, such a good name. So I'm going to say that every time, <laughs> Tentacle Duck. Uh, thank you for supporting us. And thank you to all of our future patrons. Uh, we couldn't make this show as easily without your assistance. And we are really grateful to have you here with us. That is uh, oh, regrettably, truly regrettably, <laughs> all we have for today. Uh, no reviews to read. If you do end up wanting to brighten our day or give me an early birthday present, uh, you can review. Uh, and if you want your review read right here, you can stop by Apple Podcasts, Podchaser or Podcast Addict and leave a five star review. We really do appreciate everyone that comes our way. For now, though, uh, relax those shoulders, take some deep breaths, drink some water, enjoy something spooky if you're into that, um, and keep making those amazing people. We'll see you next time. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter. And I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at LordNeptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permissions from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero, remixed by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used in today's guest can also be found in the show notes. If you'd like to support our show, find us on Patreon. Get access to bonus episodes, extra outtakes, and much more at patreon.com slash character creation cast. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Nailed it. Huzzah. There we go. I hey, did it so I've, good. I've got too many background bumpies. i got to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Oh, language. Um, I'm trying to be good. <laughs> um, nope. We've reached the part where we're going to have to force you to name a person. Oh, yeah, I know. While I was out there, I grabbed my book. <laughs> <laughs> um, Which are used for two things in this house me naming characters and my daughter naming her dolls. All right, so we can stop yeah. this recording here and save it on. Nailed it. Yep. I also realize I've not been sitting very close to the microphone this entire time because my... Yeah. I've been able to hear you just fine. Okay. Theoretically. <laughs> you can fix that later. Theoretically, yes, I can. Yeah. I'll leave that up to you. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I got you. I have like a sweet spot that I have to put the mic in so that because I've got like one of those line mics where it's like, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, you know, it's about arm's length at an, a at the specific angle to prevent mm -hmm. peaking. Yeah, mine is just like hanging out over my monitor, coming down here. You got that sweet Everybody stand at now. work on my work calls is always like, how come you sound so clear? And I'm like, because I'm a professional. <laughs> Listen, the rest of you are calling in on your cell phone. Get into podcasting. It'll be fine. Mm -hmm. There we go. We did Woo! it. Duh.